on occasion talk about how Sunday sermons are going, and I look to her for guidance. And so she gave me some hints. And so you, you probably won't, we won't be reading as much scripture today as we have in the last few weeks. We're making reference to it, as I have been telling you before, we're going through practically every book in the Bible. We're now to the book of Ezekiel and uh, for our Be Light series. Therefore, if you want to get a good grasp of everything that this message comes from, you need to read the book of Ezekiel. But I'll give you a warning. The entire book almost is a vision from God to Ezekiel. So it, it is shrouded in uh, symbolism and allegory and such. So when you read it, read it slow and understand that it is a vision that God has given to the priest slash prophet Ezekiel for the people of Israel, but also for us and our future in the coming of Jesus Christ returning to earth. So that's your assignment this week. Read the book of Ezekiel if you haven't done it yet. By the way, just as a heads up, you can get a head start on the sermon in two weeks because next week Oscar Mark will be here to speak. In two weeks we're going to go to the next book following Ezekiel. And so that will give you uh, a chance to um, get caught up. That one, by the way, is <laughs> it's, it, it's a fascinating story. And if you think you're scratching your head in some of these books we're doing now, um, well, we're going to be going to Daniel, and then we'll be going to Hosea. And in, in the stories of truth, this really happened, just get better and better. It's just like, yeah, wow, am I glad that we don't operate that way now, if, we, if you're a prophet, that is, because they went through a lot in order to proclaim what God wanted the people of Israel to hear. With that being said, if you're a visitor with us, if you've never been here, um, understand we're going through a series called the Be Light series. Our, our key verse is Ephesians 5.8. If you were a follower of Christ, you were once darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Live, then, as children of light. Today's message deals with Ezekiel. As I mentioned, he's a priest and a prophet who ministers during the dark 70 years of Judah's captivity by the Babylonians. Ezekiel actually was taken from during the siege of Jerusalem that we talked about last week uh, through Jeremiah, and he was taken into Babylonia. Whereas last week was a real downer kind of a message <laughs> because of Jeremiah's ministry was 40 years of telling people they're condemned, uh, and spoke of condemnation. Ezekiel saw the light at the end of the tunnel, which we'll be talking about today, for Judah's restoration, and that's what we're going to focus on. Now, I'm going to give you a brief background on Ezekiel and the, cir and the circumstances. You're going to have to read it all to kind of get it fully to appreciate it, and then we're going to look at one part of the vision that God gave to Ezekiel. First of all, the background. We're looking at the man, Ezekiel, first of all. He was a younger contemporary of Jeremiah and Daniel. Remember, Jeremiah started when he was young. But he was a younger contemporary. He ministered for 22 years in captivity. He lived with the exiles by the irrigation canal of Kabar. And the reason that's so significant, because when we talk about Daniel uh, in the next few weeks, Daniel was in the king's court. So Daniel is in this real luxurious surroundings, and Ezekiel is living very much in a kind of a pauper life, if you will, in captivity. Ezekiel's name means God strengthens. And it's very important because all the names of the prophets seem to fit with the ministry that they had. Now that's the man Ezekiel. The book of Ezekiel is divided into two periods. There's the end of the siege of Jerusalem. This is the, the message of destruction and condemnation. So Ezekiel starts with that because that's what's going on in reality. Jerusalem is under that siege that we talked about. And as a reminder, that siege, that siege was so bad that that parents were so hungry that they were resorting to eating their own children. Bodies were laying in the streets. Disease was rampant. There was no water because of a famine that had taken place. There was hardly any food. And so there were bodies being piled up and laying in the streets of Jerusalem as the Babylonians had surrounded the city. 
And so this is what was going on in this siege. And so it was a very, very dark and, and troublesome time. And the re reason that that was happen happening was because of the fact that Israel, Judah, had turned its back on God. Jerusalem's fall is the second period, and that's the message of comfort and the coming of God's kingdom. If you remember last week, Jeremiah told the people of Judea that were in the city of Jerusalem, he said, if we will surrender, things will be better. But the false prophets and counselors spoke to the king and said, no, we need to hang on because this is all going to pass, we're going to be okay. And they didn't listen to truth. And as a result, they experienced great misery. So Jerusalem's fall actually brought a message of comfort and the coming of God's kingdom, and that's what Ezekiel then was telling the people. So that's the two periods. The book itself is divided into three parts. We're not going to read those three parts, but just give you clarity what they are. First part in chapters 1 through 24 is God's judgment against his wayward people, and that's kind of the condemnation thing. That's all that's been going on with Jerusalem because of the fact, in essence, if you think about Israel's history, they spent 40 years in the wilderness because of their rebellion and disobedience and not trusting God. And now they're spending 70 years in captivity for the same reason. And so here's a God's judgment against his wayward people. Secondly, God's judgment against the nations in chapters 25 through 32, not just the nation of Israel, but the, na the nations that were also attacking uh, Israel, and taking, beating up on Israel, if you will. And then third, chapter 33 through 48, is God's renewed blessing on his repentant people. And that's where we're going to kind of land this morning, about his renewed uh, blessing on his repentant people. So we're going to focus on Ezekiel's vision of restoration. And it is an amazing vision, to say the least. Um, a vision can come in dreams or it can come in a time of, of uh, and prayer, if you will. I, I think that these are, um, if you've ever heard from the Lord, and I hope that you have in your prayer time, when you're making a decision, a lot of times when we hear from the, God, from the Lord, it is, it is clear, it is concise, and it's to the point. You know, should I buy this house? And you're praying about this, and you're, and you're maybe fasting over this, and suddenly God gives you the direction. This is what I want you to do about this. And it's like, okay, I understand it. The vision here, that's not a vision. That's hearing from God. A vision is this picture story of what's going to happen or what could happen, or it's an allegory of what's going to happen about, in, in, in an unusual way, the picture, the vision is telling a truth about something that's going to happen, but it's not going to happen according to the picture. You understand what I'm saying? It's a symbolism of what God's going to do. And that's what Ezekiel is having here. He's having a vision, a symbolism of what God's going to do. Ezekiel's vision of restoration. I'm going to read the first 14 verses of chapter 37 so you understand this vision in its context. The hand of the Lord was upon me, and he brought me out of, by the Spirit of the Lord and set me down in the middle of the valley and it was full of bones. He caused me to pass among round about, and behold, there were many on the surface of the valley, and lo, there were, they were very dry. In other words, they're, they're being sunbaked. He said to me, Son of man, can these bones live? And I answered, O oh, Lord God, you know. And again he said to me, Prophesy over these bones, and say to them, O oh, dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord God to these bones, Behold, I will cause breath to enter you that you may come to life. I will put sinews on you and make flesh grow back on you, cover you with skin and put breath in you that you may come alive and you will know that I am the Lord. So I prophesied as I was commanded. And as I prophesied, there was a noise and behold, a rattling and the bones came together, bone to bone. And I looked and behold, sinews were on them and flesh grew and skin covered them, but there was no breath in them. Then he said to me, prophesy to the breath, prophesy, son of man, and say to the breath, thus says the Lord God, come from the four winds, O breathe, and breathe on these slain, that they come to life. So I prophesied as he commanded me, and breath came into them, 
and they came to life and stood on their feet, an exceedingly great army. Then he said to me, Son of man, these bones are the whole house of Israel. Behold, they say, our bones are dried up and our hope has perished. We are completely cut off. Therefore prophesy and say to them, Thus says the Lord God, Behold, I will open your graves and cause you to come up out of your graves, my people, and I will bring you into the land of Israel. Then you will know that I am the Lord when I have opened your graves and caused you to come up out of your graves, my people. I will put my spirit within you and you will come to life and I will place you on your land, own land. Then you will know that I, the Lord, have spoken and done it, declares the Lord. Understand, this is a vision. It did not really happen. Okay? But it's a vision to proclaim to the people of Israel what is going to happen in their nation of Israel. The allegory here is the, through the valley of dried bones is in verses 1 through 10, and then the renewed, the spirit, is in verses 11 through 14. You see, and you get it. I'll just paraphrase quick. We just read it. Eli, um, Ezekiel goes, and there's this valley, and it's completely covered with dry bones. In other words, they're, they're, they're baking in the sun. They're, they're, they're good for dogs and gnaw, I guess, but that's about it. And they're scattered all over. They're not even connected. And then God says to Ezekiel, in this vision, you prophesy over them. Do you think that they can have flesh come back on them? And he says, well, you know God. You can do anything, is what he's saying. Then he tells them, prophesy. And sure enough, the bones start connecting. And you've heard that song, the what is it, elbow bone connects to the shoulder bone, the shoulder bone connects to the hip bone, or not hip bone, but up here someplace. <laughs> but you know that song. That's where this comes from, okay? Uh, them bones are going to rise again, that Negro spiritual. That's where these come from. That songs come from. And all these bones start connecting, and, he, and Ezekiel is watching in his vision all of this, and then, and then the, the, the uh, tendons and all this stuff starts connecting, and then the flesh muscle starts coming, and skin's on it, and all of a sudden you have probably thousands of dead bodies laying on the valley floor. And then God says to Ezekiel, prophesy and bring life into these bodies. And he does, and they all come to life, and it's a huge army for Israel. What he's telling them is, right now you are living in captivity. Your capital city has been destroyed. You have been scattered or put in prison, a captivity in Babylon. You are no longer a nation of prominence or strength. But you are still God's chosen people. And right now you feel like you are these dried bones baking in the sun. But I'm here to tell you that the nation of Israel will rise to prominence again one day. That's the message here. The steps of restoration that God's proclaiming through Ezekiel. He's telling Ezekiel, you will regain your prominence and your position as a nation of strength. Does anyone here know what year that was when that finally took place? Anybody got a guess? That's it, 1948. Okay, hundreds, thousands of years later. When finally Israel rose up and they had the battle out there in the, in the Middle East and it became a nation once again. Doesn't mean it's a nation that's loved by the world. Matter of fact, read the news. I just read recently that our government of the United States is not recognizing Jerusalem as the capital city of Israel. I don't know how you can do that, being that they recognize themselves as the capital city. But we are saying, no, Jerusalem's not the capital. We, they, are, they are still under the affliction of many nations rising up against them. However, there is a second part of this prophecy. The second part is that your king is coming back. And he will establish his place of reign in the city, your capital city, Jerusalem. And his name is Jesus. You see, one part of this prophecy 
this vision has already been fulfilled. The second one is yet to come. And in the same way that Jerusalem or the people of Judea were supposed to hold on with hope that one day Israel will be reestablished as a powerful nation and that the, that the bones will come together and the sinews and the flesh and life will come back into the nation of Israel, one day the earth, all nations, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord and God will set up his earthly kingdom on, on this earth through Jesus Christ. That's the whole restoration process that Ezekiel is sharing to the people of Israel. Did they catch it back then? I don't think so. They probably caught the first part. Maybe. But they're living in this misery. They're living in captivity. And so they're, you know, you know how you feel when things are going really bad and someone says, cheer up, it's going to get better. Oh, yeah, thanks for that. You know, that's great. Yep, yep, yep. But what, what Ezekiel was to do was, where Jeremiah's whole ministry, his 40 years of ministry, was to say, you, you is, including himself into this, we are a people of sin and rebellion, and because of what Manasseh did when he uh, instituted the, the human sacrifices and tore down uh, those things that were honorable to God and put up those things that were dishonorable because of that and now we're worse than they are than they were when they established that this is why we're going through all this we have rebelled against God and God will not let it go on forever there will be a day of reckoning there will be the wrath of God instituted upon people who reject him and rebel against him especially if they know better that's why we read about in the scriptures in, the, in, in Revelations, it talks about two judgments. The great white throne judgment, which is those who have never prayed to receive Christ, and the judgment seat of Christ for those who have prayed to receive Christ. Now the great white throne judgment will separate those who are lost, separated from God, forever. And put them with the devil and his dominion in hell. The judgment seat of Christ is where we as believers will stand before God and we will give a reckoning of how we lived our life on earth for his purposes. Were we faithful or were we faithless? Did we honor him or did we dishonor him? Did we share our faith or did we not share our faith? There will be a day of reckoning. We won't lose our salvation, but there will be a great time of Great suffering, I believe, of our conscience and our in our in standing before Christ before we're ent we enter into God's kingdom. I want to hear, and I believe you do too. Well done, you good and faithful servant. Enter into the kingdom of God. But we will come to what's called the behemoth seat, and there will be this recording of everything we did in our life. Everything we were part of before our salvation, everything should be blank. Because once we come to Christ, all of that is erased. All of our sin is gone. But once we come to faith in Christ, then all that we have done for Christ, unless we've sought his forgiveness and has been reconciled with him for disobeying him, that'll show up. And I know it's kind of like, well, pastor, this sounds... Hmm. Get on to something else. This is kind of a downer. But you need to be warned. That was what Ezekiel was doing to the people of Israel. We need to understand. This is not just some kind of fairy tale story. And yeah, that's too bad. And yeah, God will probably slap my hand and say, shame on you. God does not just slap your hand when it comes to rebellion and sin. There is reckoning. There is a wrath of God against sinfulness. And I don't know what he's going to do at the judgment seat of Christ for those who are believers, but yet are, are, are really rebelling against him. I don't know what it is. But I know that God does not let sin just be overlooked. So be aware. It is, it is there, here, brought to us as a message of, be careful. How we live our life. The neat thing is, in 1 John 1, 9, written to those who have received Christ, it says, if we forgive, if we confess our sins, he, Jesus, will forgive us of our sins and cleanse us of all unrighteousness. 
So we don't have to go to the judgment seat of Christ with all this burden and all this pain. We remember the bad things we've done. We do. We shouldn't live under the guilt of those when we pray and ask Christ to forgive us because it says he washes, he separates that as far as the east is from the west. Which means if you start going east, you'll never go west. It'll, you'll never come in contact with it again unless, of course, we surrender to the sin, the temptation again. So we can live in the glory of the fact that once we confess our sins and ask Christ to forgive us, he separates it from us forever. However, you know as well as I do that there are those moments in time where we know God prompts us to do something or prompts us not to do something and we kind of surrender to it anyway in the wrong way and then we kind of forget it. We kind of shovel under the, you know, it wasn't that bad. You know, everybody, everybody's afraid to share their faith so, you know, I'm just with the rest of the crowd. And we never deal with it the way God wants us to. Those kind of things definitely God will bring up in that video recording of our life before him. So be aware, first of all, so that we don't live in the valley of dry bones. We don't need to be, we don't also need to live in a way, and I need to share this for those of you that feel that your life, you don't have the qualifications to serve God yet. You may think you don't, but God is in you through Christ. And you've heard that terminology, and God don't make no junk. Okay? You see, that's why we are given spiritual gifts. Once you accept Christ as your Savior, surrender to Him and ask Him to forgive you, confess and ask Him to forgive your sins, then God removes that sin from you, and he, the Spirit of God takes residence in your life and then he gives you and me special gifts called the gifts of the Holy Spirit. They're mentioned in Romans and Ephesians, Corinthians. We need to discover what our gift is. It could be hospitality. Everybody loves that gift because it's an easy one. Oh, I'll just serve food. Yeah. It could be the gift of helps. It could be the gift of teaching or evangelism. It could be the gift of prophecy, gift of tongues, gift of healing. All of them are listed there. I don't know, well, some of you I do, but I don't know what gifts God's given you, but I know that he has equipped you with a special gift to build up the body of Christ and to bring unity to the faith of Christ, in Christ. He has given you a gift. So unless you are dead, you still have a responsibility to exercise that gift. Now, I'm not going to pick on our seniors, but I can use my, my parents as an example. My dad is, I don't know how old my dad, 89. And, he, and we have talks about this kind of thing. He's a follower of Christ, reads his Bible, and asks me lots of questions about what he's reading. But when we talk about serving, well, Kev, I did my time. And then we get into it. Not mad, I'm not badly. I just get I just go after my dad. I said, Dad, are you still breathing? Well, yeah, God's good to me. That's right. And until you're dead, you have a purpose in life. It's not to collect pension from the from your army, you know, social security from the government. It's not just to go to church for an hour on Sunday morning. You are given a responsibility to you be used of God until you are promoted to glory. And it doesn't matter if you're in a wheelchair. It doesn't matter if you're flat on your back. If you can think cognitively, then you are responsible to serve God in some fashion. Am I getting to you yet? Don't live in the dry bones. Don't sit back and say, well, I did my time, or I don't have, I don't have the charisma of other people. I don't have the, the skills of other people. I've been handicapped because of health reasons or something else. I, am, I, don't, I, don't, I, I don't meet that, what I see other people do. Well, you're not supposed to do what other people do. You're supposed to do what God tells you to do. And that is to serve him until you're promoted to glory or he returns. Discover what that is because there is so much joy in serving God. 
It is incredible. And I want you to know, as a warning, kind of like what Ezekiel was doing with the people of Israel, once we realize that, then we will be held accountable for how we obeyed God in that or disobeyed Him. Serve the Lord well. You know, I read someplace that you were once darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Live as children of light. This whole message that Ezekiel had was one of restoration. Restoration is to set a broken bone back into place. That's the definition. Restoration is to set a broken bone back into place. To restore that which has been severely damaged and to reset it so it can heal. I want to give you in the application here just steps of, reckon, of restoration. Because you may be here this morning and you feel like a broken bone. You may feel like you're not living up to your potential when it comes to the things of God. Or, or maybe you're broken in such a fashion that you are completely broken in half and you're separated from God. And you need His salvation to restore that relationship between you and Him. Here's the steps of reconciliation or restoration. First of, not, first of all, recognize failure, which is sin. A little later on this morning, we are going to, not very much longer, we're going to have together the communion elements. In our congregation, and our church fellowship, the only thing that prohibits you from sharing of the t at the table of the Lord is if you are a non-believer, you don't have faith in Christ, or there's something God wants you, someone that... God wants you to go to to reconcile your, your differences before you come to the elements of the table. Those two things. And that's between, obviously, you and the Lord. But in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, the Apostle Paul really gives us a, a formula for taking the elements of the Lord's table. He starts off by saying in verse 23, For I have received, of chapter 11, I have received from the Lord that which I have also delivered to you, in other words, I am under the divine inspiration of the Holy Spirit. That the Lord Jesus, in the night in which he has betrayed, was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup also after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Therefore, whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner shall be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. But a man must examine himself, and in so doing he is to eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For he who eats and drinks, eats and drinks judgment to himself, if he does not judge the body rightly. And for this reason... Many among you are weak and sick, and a number have died. But if we judged ourselves rightly, we would not be judged. But when we are judged, we are disciplined by the Lord, so that we will not be condemned along with the world. Dry bones again. When we come to the element of the Lord's table, we are standing looking, as so, to speak, as so to speak, over our life, in the valley of the dry bones. What do we see? Do we see a body with life in the valley, an army, in relation to our life, in relationship with God? Or do we see my bones, dry, useless, because I have not examined myself correctly? You get the, get the picture there? You see, the reason Jesus instituted this ordinance to the body of Christ was so that we would have those repeating moments of, of saying, God, where do I stand in relationship with you? Am I being faithful with the things you have given me, with the gifts you have given me, with the 
with the connections and the relationships you've given me on earth? Am I, am I resisting and, and saying no to temptation? Or am I in, 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 involved with sin secretly that no one else knows about? Or maybe it's a sin that I'm doing openly and everybody knows about it. But I don't care. You see, Jesus, one of the reasons he gave us the communion elements is to remind us what Jesus did for us in dying on the cross, suffering for our sins, but also that there would be a place that we could, we could go back to and, and kind of a, a checkoff point. If this was the judgment seat of Christ, what would, be, what would happen next? But it's not. So therefore, I can come before God and examine myself, asking the Spirit to judge me. Reveal to me anything in my life that's offensive to God. And if there is something, I can confess it before Him, and He will forgive me of my sin. And He will restore to these dry bones flesh and blood. And then I can take of the elements and celebrate the goodness of God through Son, Jesus Christ. I can celebrate and be reminded of the sacrifice that was made on my behalf on the cross of Calvary. On your behalf. It needs to begin by, first of all, recognizing sin. That's the first step of restoration. The second step is repentance. The prerequisite for restoration it, it, restoration won't happen unless we repent, meaning we, we turn away from and we go the opposite direction of the sin that we have engaged in. I, I'm sorry, the second one is taking responsibility for your sin. Then repentance. Look at the responsibility first. Sometimes when we sin, and re, you remember, those of you that are my age, uh, a guy named Flip Wilson, remember that, that African-American comedian? And he'd dress up like this lady named Geraldine, and he'd say what? The devil made me do it. The devil made me do it. No, the devil didn't make you do it. The devil may have tempted you to do it. But we have our own choices. We must take responsibility for our sin. Romans 7, 24 and 5 says, Wretched man. Paul is speaking about his sin and the fact that he keeps going to to the thing he shouldn't do, rather than doing the thing he knows God wants him to do. And he says, wretched man that I am, who will set me free from this body of death, this death? In other words, he says, I take responsibility for this. But what do I do with this? How am I delivered from this? And then he says, thanks be to God through Jesus Christ, our Lord. He knows that his restoration comes through Christ. Then the third point is the repent. He sees the sin, recognizes it, and takes responsibility for it. And then the prerequisite for the restoration is found in Romans 6, 1 through 2. What shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin so that grace may be increased? Everybody will see grace because I'm sinning and God's forgiving? No. May it never be. How shall we who died to sin be still live in it? How can we say sin's dead if it still lives in us? We are, we are to have a new life. You see, sin is death, separates us from God. The dry bones in the valley were there because of the sin. That's the imagery. There because of the condemnation. And if they're left there, it's total misery and separation from the goodness and the power and the person of God. But suddenly in this prophecy, in this vision, Ezekiel is speaking the words of God to these bones and the bones are responding to the word of God. And they're coming together and they're getting tendons. And there's blood, uh, there's blood coming in and muscle coming in and organs coming in and flesh covering the body. And then life is brought through the breath of God and you have this army for God. The nation of God is restored. In the same way that when a person confesses his sin before God, repents of his sin, and asks Christ to cleanse him from all unrighteousness, the dead is gone. The sin is death. It has been removed, and in its place, a new life has come. The, 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 the power of God, the, the, the Spirit of God, the presence of God, the glory of God has been brought in us. 
Old things have passed away, but new things have come. Yeah. That happens at our salvation. It happens over and over again when we realize we have offended God and we have sinned against God and we ask God to forgive us. He's faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. How great is that? We don't deserve it. That's called grace. God gives us what we don't deserve. Once we repent then, listen to this. We thank God for the reprimand. Part of the restoration process is to thank God that he pursued us. We read in the Corinthians passage that if you come to the table in an unclean fashion, for this reason some of you get sick. For this reason some of you even die as a reprimand to remind you this is a very sacred, very reverent occasion. One to be celebrated, but to be celebrated correctly. Thank God for the reprimand. Psalm 119, 67 and 71 says, Before I was afflicted, I went astray. But now I keep your word. It is good for me that I was afflicted, that I may learn your statutes. I know that you and I look upon life here on earth, the flesh and blood, differently than God does. We do. We cherish life, and we're supposed to. But understand that our life does not end with our death. We are eternal creatures. And we will either spend eternity with God in His kingdom, or eternity separated from God in hell. During this course of time that we're on this planet, and we are breathing Yes, we're supposed to cherish life, uphold it, honor it. However, God as a loving, loving Heavenly Father rebukes and reprimands His children in a way that gets our attention through sickness, through crisis, through death. Because it awakens us to truth. Now, it's not saying we have to go through that. I mean, the world, the curse of sin is in the world, so we all are going to experience death and sickness. We all will. He will not, he will not protect us from that. But he will also use that. Remove his protection when we begin to remove him from our lives so that we will wake up. It's kind of like when my children were growing up and they were little. I was, I was a parent that spanked seldom, but when it happened, it happened for a good reason. And it wasn't just to inflict suffering on my children. It was to let them know that you think this hurts. If I let you go the direction you're going, life will be a lot worse for you. And that's God's way of spanking us, I guess you could say, getting our attention. And, I, and, and the reason I preface this with we look at life as being precious is that we don't understand that. It's like, well, why would God, why would God inflict harm on someone? To him, it's not harm, it's discipline. It's reprimand. It's wake up so that you can embrace the goodness of God while still here on earth. So I thank God. Before I was afflicted, I went astray, but now I keep your word. It is good for me that I was afflicted that I may learn your statutes. And finally, a step of restoration is to demonstrate restoration. In other words, live in it. You, you and I who have accepted Christ were once darkness. But now we live light, we are light in the Lord. So let's live as children of light. Amen. We're going to invite you to the communion table here. Obviously, I want to give you a chance to search your heart before God.
Again, as a reminder, if you're, if you're visiting with us, um, you don't have to be a member of this church to receive the elements. You only have to be a part of God's family by salvation in Him. If this morning you're here, and I don't know, there may be someone here that has never received Christ. You've never confessed your sins before Him. You've never asked Him to forgive you. You've never surrendered to the Lordship and salvation of Jesus. You can do that this morning. During our quiet time, you just simply need to confess that and say, Jesus, I understand that I, I, am, I am a sinner. I am born with sin, and I have chosen to rebel against you in many areas of my life. And I repent of all that. I confess that to you, Jesus. And I ask now, I surrender my life. Transform me so that I am different now and forever than I, I've ever been to this point. And God will forgive you and, and welcome you into the family. I just encourage you that if you make that confession, if you say that prayer, tell someone so they can hold you accountable and help you to grow in your faith. The other thing is we're to examine ourselves. This is a chance of renewal, a restoration for those of us who are followers of Christ as well. So let's take some quiet time to examine ourselves before God, asking the Spirit to speak into our lives. We're going to ask this morning when I give you instruction in a few moments to come up to the table, O oh Lord, to serve yourself today and go back and take your seat. If someone needs help in receiving the elements, just raise your hand. One of our, our people will bring you the elements. And then following the first song, we're going to sing a second song. And we do believe that God is our healer. And if you have something that is bothering you, if you have an illness and you want to bring it before God and ask him to, to, to heal your body, we're, we're going to trust him to do that, believing that he will do what is right. And, and, um, and so you can just come up. As you come up to get your elements, just stay here, and we'll have people pray for you for the healing of your body, if that's what you choose. Or if you want to come up and pray and stay and pray, that's fine. You want to come up and share uh, have someone walk you through the prayer of salvation. You're welcome to do that. Our elders, we only have a few here today. They're going to be up front. Our deaconesses are invited to come and just be up front as well. Our worship team has already received the elements this morning so that we can sing for you and with you as we uh, have you come up and get the elements. But before we have you come forward, let's just take a few moments and examine ourselves before God to make sure that we take in a worthy manner. Let's pray together. Father, I just pray now as people pray silently to you. I pray for anyone that might be here that doesn't have a relationship with you, only knows about you, but has never been brought back into your family because that sin has separated them. That this morning they will confess that sin before you. Pray for you to forgive them and surrender their life to yours. I pray for those of us that are coming to the elements that, Lord, will be a great time of celebration as we seek renewal, restoration of our life to you for anything that may have become a barrier between us and you. Thank you, God, for this message of the dry bones and the joy of restoration in Christ Jesus. Hear now the prayers of your people, I pray.